But first, we continue with our look at the opioid crisis. Tonight, the difficulty of getting people into treatment. In December, Congress earmarked a billion dollars for states to fight the addiction crisis over the next two years. Many treatment facilities still lack resources, so services aren't often available when they're needed. William Brangham recently traveled to Rhode Island to see a program that deploys former drug users to the front lines. It's part of our ongoing series, America Addicted. I lived down here for years on lived the street. right here? I did, yep. 30-year-old uh, Jonathan day, Goyer has spent more than half his life addicted to drugs. I struggled with opiates and, and addiction of cocaine, of, of benzos such as Xanax, Klonopin, and Ativan. Struggled with alcohol, struggled with crystal meth, bath salts, hallucinogenics, tranquilizers. That is a hell of a menu. It is. I planned on dying. That was my plan. So I continued to use drugs until death would hopefully arrive at my doorstep. 32-year-old Roxanne Newman also spent years on the street addicted. I've had people, when they want to hurt me, they'll say, you know, you're a junkie, you're a crackhead, you're a prostitute, you're a hooker. But today, after long and difficult roads, Goyer and Newman are both clean. And now they're helping others battle their own addiction. Have you thought more about treatment? They call themselves recovery coaches. They work for a group called Anchor Recovery in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. It's a government-funded program started in 2010. Yeah, did you get a hold of the guy from yesterday? The idea here is that people who have struggled with addiction themselves, and specifically opioids, are uniquely qualified to serve on the front lines of the addiction crisis at this critical moment. And it's better to check yourself before something really bad happens. Mm -hmm. Connecting with those who are still struggling and to show them that another life is possible. How do I convey that we use the same drugs, share the same needles, walk the same street, got high in the same house? Like, how do I convey to this person that they can do it? If I can do it, you can do it. There's six of us here, so we're going to break off into three different groups of two. And We spent a few days with Goyer and his team to see how they work and to see whether this approach, which is currently yeah, sure. being studied by the federal government, here, can not. actually put a dent in the opioid crisis. We went with them as they visited overdose victims in emergency rooms, when they went to recovery meetings like Narcotics Anonymous, even when they just met with people on the streets of Rhode Island. Here, take some Narcan just in case you know how to use it. Ryan Duxbury, that's him in the plaid shirt, is another recovery coach. He's a former opioid addict who used to come and use drugs in this same part of town. Got some Narcan here. Yes. Yes. Today, he's handing out Narcan, the emergency life-saving drug that can instantly reverse an opioid overdose. The other day, I was dead. My left again. We are not healthcare workers. We are trying to approach people as another human being, as a pair, as uh, on the same level. There's no, I'm not up here, you're not down here, we're just on the same level. Duxbury says giving out Narcan saves lives, for sure, but these interactions are also about making connections so that if and when someone wants to get clean, they know where to turn. Well, in case you change your mind, here's our phone number, okay? Do you have any sense of how many people from this street interaction that you guys have gotten into treatment? So just in the last year and a half, we've gotten over 400 people into off the streets into either detox or long-term residential um, treatment 400 options. people? Over 400 With how people. many staff members? Uh, we started with two, and we're up to six. It's me and you, that's it. <laughs> Goyer says this is the power of deploying people who have walked the walk, who know what active addiction is really like and what it takes to get out. There are over 24 million Americans in this country that have overcome addiction, and I really think we should just turn to them and simply ask, how did you guys do it? Jonathan Goyer only did it after going to detox 38 times, suffering a near-fatal heroin overdose, and finally, using what's considered the gold standard, medically-assisted treatment, that's methadone or other drugs like Suboxone or Vivitrol. That was me graduating from kindergarten. We visited and with him and his mom at his place in Providence. As you start slipping into addiction, you start disappearing from the family pictures. Yeah. Absolutely, including um, even family Christmas. Goyer began using drugs when he was 15. His father died from an overdose in 2004. 
His brother followed a few years later. Jonathan, is it Breuer? At the depth of his own addiction just five years ago, this was him, standing before a judge after crashing a stolen car high on hallucinogenic bath salts. When my mother saw me on the news the next day, instead of being shocked that I was arrested or embarrassed, she was relieved because she knew I was alive. That's where drug addiction brought me, and that's where it brought her. Goyer says it was his overdose that finally drove him to change. I woke up in an emergency room, and I was offered a second chance at life. And, and here's what I've done with it. Recovery coach from Anchor. Here's emergency here's rooms are, in fact, another place where Anchor Recovery sends its coaches, people like George O'Toole. O'Toole also spent many years as an addict, committed 26 felonies, and did more than 20 years in prison. Recovery coaches are making great contact with um, people after seeing them in the emergency room. Hoping to reach other active yep. users at this crucial moment, O'Toole now coordinates with every hospital in Rhode Island so that when an overdose victim comes in, anchor is alerted and a coach is sent to the hospital. When that coach arrives at the bedside, the hope is that a conversation begins. We don't expect everybody to leave this hospital and never use again. It's not like a bedside transformation. It, it, absolutely not. It takes time. It takes work because everybody's pathway to recovery is different. So you have 30 minutes to get to the hospital. Roxanne Newman is one of those coaches who goes to the hospital to meet with addicts at their bedside. Seeing her now at church on Sunday, married to a cop, mother to a little girl, it's hard to believe she overdosed at least 20 times in her many years addicted to cocaine and heroin. She says even with what she refers to as her long education in addiction, that bedside pitch is never easy. First of all, when I'm walking in, I pray because I know that this moment is bigger than me. And I let them know. I actually work at the hospital that I had my experience, my last overdose. With the hospital you last overdosed at, you now go to? I go to. God, what does that feel like? Well, it just feels, I feel blessed to be able to walk in because I, when I tell somebody, I've woken up in this bed before. Literally. Literally. I've been in this room. I've been in your position. I know exactly how you feel at this moment. I think that moment is the most important thing. Is people, when people say, yes, I want treatment, it has to be available because it may only be a moment. Kimberly Johnson is one of the nation's top experts on drug addiction and mental health. She directs the federal government's Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, and she's currently studying the Anchor program in Rhode Island. One of the places that we are struggling with is the whole counseling piece. And if we have to have everybody that's master's level trained counselors, we aren't going to have enough people to do it. So that is a critical role for recovery coaches is to help people navigate the system and get the services and the care that they need when they need it. The right treatment is really the treatment that the person is willing to accept at that given time. Jonathan Goyer says recovery coaches are crucial for navigating the system, but often what the coaches have to offer comes down to what kind of insurance the patients have and what kind of treatment they can afford. This is one day at a time. Treatment options range from short-term detox programs and various levels of counseling. It can be residential inpatient treatment, which can last a few days to a few months. It can be intensive outpatient programs, like this one that meets 15 hours a week. And at that point, we started bringing the methadone down. Right. Or it can be various medically assisted treatments, such as this methadone clinic. But openings in all these places are scarce at the very moment when the demand for them is spiking. This is your safety net here. Rhode Island has seen a 90% increase in overdose deaths in the last five years. My job is to convince somebody to get treatment, and then when they say yes, Sometimes the treatment's not available. It put me in a funky situation. Here I am pouring my heart and soul and trying to help them, and, and I call and there's no beds. One message often repeated at Anchor is that the paths to recovery vary widely. So all done. Roxanne Newman says all she done. did three court-ordered stints at intensive outpatient programs. <laughs> None of them really worked. She says ongoing counseling, along with the support of her church and her husband, even her long runs, is what keeps her from relapsing. She met her husband, Major Mike Newman, who's the number two at the Pawtucket Police Force, just after she'd gotten clean and she was a waitress in a diner he often went to. Whenever he would come in, like none of the waitresses could have the table. It was like an unspoken rule, mm. like, this is my table. Mm. You can't touch my table. 
On their first date, she said that, like a lot of people in recovery, she had to have a very frank conversation about her past, like the fact that she was being treated for hepatitis C. I'm explaining to somebody who I could potentially engage in a sexual relationship with that I have a, you know, infectious disease that I got because I used to shoot heroin when I was a prostitute on the streets of Providence. <laughs> Can you pass me the salt? <laughs> like, <laughs> How did he take it? <laughs> Mike's, which I love the most about him, Mike's, um, one of his key little statements is people are not throwaway. And he didn't, well, my, I, could, I could cry, he, he didn't see that I was, had been a junkie and, and all these things. He saw what he told me later on when we examined this. He told me that he saw someone who was just trying so hard to get out of the situation that they had wound up in. This is sort of where a lot of people end up. For Jonathan um, Goyer, he credits a 90-day stay at this residential treatment facility that got him clean. So that's me and my brother there. He went on methadone after that and now goes to regular counseling. But he says he's alive today mainly because of his mom, a woman he stole from, lied to, and forced to spend countless worried nights. But she never gave up on him. I knew from his childhood and everything that we had been through together that inside there was a good person. Jonathan. Goyer says his life is living proof that recovery is possible for anyone. Statistically, I'm supposed to be dead. I'm supposed to be in jail. But yet I'm out, I'm here, I'm able to make amends for my, the devastation caused by my active addiction. I'm a taxpayer, I got my driver's license back. You're a legit citizen. I'm, <laughs> that's what they tell me. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, so, it's so crazy to me. Inca Recovery says it will expand in the coming months, bringing on more recovery coaches. Its model is also being examined by several other states who want to replicate it. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham in Rhode Island.